because I'm going to go out on a walk around this San Lando Park and Seminole Wakaiwa Trail. There's plenty of invasive species to show off along that way, so I hope you all enjoy some of that. But to get started, I wanted to show the species that y'all probably documented very, very well. You usually see a bunch of the little critters just scurrying. Um, oops, there's a couple moving in that bush there. But they're usually all through this area. Again, these are Cuban brown anoles. They are originally native to the island of Cuba. Um, and anoles are fairly common throughout most of the southeast, but this is one of the primary invasive ones that you're going to see around central Florida, as well as most of the rest of the state at this point. Um, these anoles aren't exactly the best for the environment, as you no may have noticed that where you find these anoles, you don't really find anything else. Um, so the native green anole has pretty much been completely displaced by this critter. Um, and the way you can tell brown anoles from green anoles is green anoles have a much more like arrow shaped head, whereas these have a little bit of a broader, fatter head. And green anoles won't have any patterning whatsoever, whereas these guys will usually have some sort of patterning on the back. Oftentimes too, that the males can get these big, large crests. So they can be a little bit difficult or er, difficult to distinguish between green and brown anoles, which the green is the native species and the brown is not. But they're still pretty easy to figure out if, you, if you've seen enough of them. So while it obviously would be nice to be able to completely remove these brown anoles since they are having a negative impact on the rest of the lizard communities and potentially other communities in central Florida, something that I want to bring up with invasive species is that that is often not very practical at all. Whether it be Burmese pythons or these anoles, once they really get established, they are really, really hard to remove. Um, in this case, you could probably sit out here constantly trying to pick off the brown anoles and, you know, removing them, but they're just going to come right back. And if they're not there, something else will probably come in and move in and take their place. Um, and while you'd hope that'd be the native green anole, more than likely there's plenty of feeder populations that are just going to source more brown anoles to these locations. So even if you were to completely remove them from your backyard, somebody else's backyard's going to drop them off. Um, and to be honest, they're actually really good at hitching rides. Um, for instance, I had a brown anole that once we found in our car as we were doing a long road trip up from Florida to North Carolina. Now, obviously, we removed that animal so it wouldn't, you know, become invasive in North Carolina, but that happens all the time. So it is something that it's really important to highlight with invasive. Another thing I kind of want to highlight is this is going to be one example of many, but there's a lot of ornamental plants that have escaped being just typical garden plants and have now turned into um, invasive plants in a lot of areas. These big triangular arrowhead shaped um, plants, I'm not entirely sure what they are, but you're gonna find them in a couple of random spots. And while they're obviously at one point planted to be there, they're no longer supposed to be there. And they often break containment and move out along the area. So that's something that's kind of important to highlight as well a lot of different invasive plants that have kind of gone out and gotten away from where we used to keep them as garden plants or all that kind of sort of stuff and are now invasive throughout most of these areas. Um, particularly where there isn't fire to remove a lot of these things, they've stuck around and are really resilient unfortunately. So let's kind of talk through some of these. Starting with the understory here, there's a lot of these different species of ferns as well as these uh, Chinese rain trees which are these trees right here. Um, all of that's invasive and has completely choked out a lot of this understory to where most of this is oak and pine which is native but a lot of it's been completely replaced all the understory has been completely replaced by these various invasive species. So say for instance you've got that climbing tree right there I'm not even sure what that is as well as a lot of this kind of stuff here and honestly about the only thing that looks native are the tall plants and some of these palmettos. I'm not entirely sure if they're cabbage palm or uh, saw palmetto, but ideally I, both of those would be, you know, uh, native, so that's not too bad. Um, but yeah, you can see very quickly that this whole area has kind of been overtaken with a lot of invasive plants. And you wouldn't believe it, there, but there's an incredible amount of money spent every year trying to remove all of these plants, particularly in natural areas. Because while it probably doesn't matter too much that you know, places like Seminole Wakaiwa Trail, which is a fairly just kind of, when it comes to habitat, it's kind of a crappy habitat. You're not really expecting much on it. But what happens is, is these areas serve as sources for other populations. 
And so ultimately a lot of these non-native plants like this grass here, I believe this is Kogan grass and it's almost damn near impossible to get rid of. Um, unfortunately what happens is, is once they establish in a place like this, it makes it really easy for them to establish in other places because they're able to seed the area with a lot of seeds and all that kind of fun stuff. And what happens is even native areas that normally would do just fine, um, they end up getting completely overrun by all of this kind of stuff. The Florida Department of uh, Re or Natural Resources spends millions of dollars every year trying to eradicate all these various different kinds of invasive plants. And while we, it's a fairly futile task, it is really important to keep them out of a lot of the native habitats so that way they don't completely go in and choke out everything else there. So while it's probably not the worst thing in the world that places like the Seminole Wakaiwa Trail are full of invasives, all it's doing is seeding other populations and becoming a problem for managers in other places. Because this trail actually will reach up into the Seminole Wakaiwa Wilderness, which is Seminole, or sorry, which is the Wakaiwa Springs State Park, Rock Springs Run State Reserve, and a couple of other places. And so while this area is probably okay, and while it's definitely not ideal to have this many invasive species, it's probably not the end of the world, but it's those other places that are then going to be impacted by these invasive species that's the problem. Well, I don't think I could do a video on invasive species in Florida without at least highlighting this species. This species is probably one of the worst and most destructive species, and there's actively millions and millions of dollars spent, both public and private, on eradicating the species on a regular basis. However, obviously, that's not always going to work. Um, and as you can tell, they've done quite well and have continued to spread and are now in places that they didn't used to be even when I was a kid. So let me go ahead and highlight the fire ant. So here's your standard fire ant mound. Now fire ants are originally native to Central and South America. And the reason why they are so voracious is because um, it's a pretty doggy dog world down there when it comes to ant species. Now. If you look, you can already see some of the soldier ants coming up to the surface. We'll kind of agitate them a little bit. There you go. That swarming aspect is one of the reasons why fire ants do so well. Um, and I'm going to have to watch my feet because I'm out here in flip-flops, which is not a smart idea to agitate a nest, but I wanted to show you it to them. Now, fire ants not only are very destructive of a pain in the butt for humans, but they can also be quite uh, problematic when it comes to wildlife species as well. Fire ants have been attributed to the loss of things like southern hognose snakes, pine snakes, because what they'll do is they'll bury into the nests and kill the uh, eggs as they're getting ready to hatch, as well as uh, the ant specialist animals like um, the uh, horned lizards out in Texas, as well as some of the various um, amphibian species as well aren't able to eat these things because they're so small that they don't really provide much in the way of nutrients. So this has led to thousands and millions and billions of dollars potentially being at, spent on an average basis just to try to get rid of all these various fire ant mountains. And they are definitely spreading throughout most of the Southeast. They didn't used to be in uh, the mountainous part of North Carolina. They started showing up there when I was a grad student. So this is definitely something that is concerning. Uh, and obviously they are a pain when it comes to human perspectives too, because if you step in that, that's going to be a miserable day for you and you're going to end up with all the little welts from their stings. So definitely not a super great plant or animal to deal with. Clearly there's a lot more research that needs to be done so we can actively remove invasive species so they're not a problem anymore. Obviously that can be a fairly futile effort, but it's at least worth trying so we can try to preserve our native biodiversity. So here's another great example of a situation where another fairly common uh, garden plant has kind of escaped and now has gone completely feral. So here you have snake plant, which is classic. It's something that's really easy to take care of. You find it a lot of like just basic how-to books when you first learn how to garden. And here's just a random plot, uh, patch of it that's absolutely super thick. And honestly, it's definitely not anywhere near some sort of homestead or anything. So maybe somebody had this like 30 or 40 years ago on their house and it got dumped out here who knows but again here's another example of where you know some of these non-native plants got put here for ornamental reasons and are now all over the place so definitely something that's kind of concerning 
Well, one of the things, I'm glad that I was able to highlight all these various different invasive species and some of the impacts they can have on different ecosystems here in Central Florida for y'all. Uh, but one of the things I kind of wanted to stop and talk about again, and but, um, I do want to highlight that we shouldn't be really demonizing the actual invasive species themselves. Unfortunately, these critters or plants or whatever were brought here inadvertently or intentionally by humans, and they're just living their life. Obviously that's very problematic for native species and has caused major issues, whether it be from competition or parasitism or predation, but we shouldn't be demonizing them just because they're invasive species. So while it is important to remove them and try to keep them off of the landscape, keep in mind, I don't hate brown anoles. I don't hate Cuban tree frogs. I actually kind of like Cuban tree frogs. They're really a cute little frog, but unfortunately because of the way everything has to work and to keep our ecosystems doing as well as possible is what's needed. But um, I really do hope you all enjoy these and I know I'm not the best vlogger in the world but I did want to highlight some of these things for y'all so you could actually see what this stuff looks like.